All right, good morning, everybody. Saturday morning at 10 a.m. We appreciate you coming to listen about one of my favorite topics, the Mediterranean diet. Um, probably you don't know this, but most of us physicians, medical doctors, don't really know that much about nutrition because we're not really taught anything about it. There are obviously some exceptions. There's exceptions to every rule. But it, by and large, um, sort of had to teach myself all of this down the road, and I've done it because I see pain every day. My patients have orthopedic problems, foot problems, shoulder problems, back pain, neck pain, what have you. A lot of it is arthritic. Some of it's inflammatory arthritis, like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, but a lot of it's obesity-related and related to chronic inflammation and stress. This sort of led me down the path of, what can I do for these folks besides prescribe pain pills, which are horrible, anti-inflammatories, which destroy the gut and the kidney and the stomach, or, you know, make them miserable with some sort of prescriptive diet. And this kind of led me down the path of reading more and researching more. And, and I think this is probably the most accessible diet with probably the best benefits. Now it's controversial, of course, and some people will disagree with me, but we'll talk about all that in the question session. So let's go on. I'm Dr. Warner of Warner Orthopedics. I also invented the Healing Soul and started Well Theory, which is my line of supplements and natural phytochemicals uh, to reduce chronic inflammation and oxidative stress. Um, because even though there are things such as a Mediterranean diet, in my opinion, it's almost impossible to eat as well as you should nowadays. So you almost have to supplement. Now, a lot of people would disagree with me, but personally, I know I don't eat well enough and I know exactly what I should be eating. So I supplement to give myself higher levels of antioxidants and to reduce my inflammation to hopefully help my brain and body out. And hopefully I can do the same for you. Um, again, I'm Dr. Warner, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I run the Warner Orthopedics and Wellness Clinic and we provide a whole host of services, all designed really to help people live their best lives, to sort of get out there and enjoy their lives and then hopefully not ever actually have to see people like me. Um, we offer everything from orthopedics to yoga. We do IV infusions with things like glutathione to reduce oxidative stress. We offer our natural wellness products. I'm a huge fan of yoga, so uh, we're starting some yoga workshops soon. Um, we have a physiatrist. We do functional fitness, and we have awesome physical therapy team here. I can't say enough good things about them. Um, next slide. So again, we talked about all of this, but basically my goal at my clinic is really to just empower you. So my function is not to keep you coming back. That's not my business model. So in other words, I don't have a business model that forces you to continue to come back because you never actually get better. That's not my idea of good care. So we really promote empowerment of your own good health and try to get you out of our clinic unless you're coming to do yoga and functional fitness, of course, uh, so that you're living your life with your family and not in doctor's offices. So let's talk about this total wellness topic, the Mediterranean diet, one of my favorites. So what are the goals of the good diet? Basically, it comes down to the old, you know, Saturday morning, Sesame Street cartoon thing. You are what you eat. It really is true. It was sort of a saying, a wives' tale, but come to find out, it's actually one of the great truths of life. So the natural way to reduce chronic inflammation, which is a cause of most of our problems nowadays, and oxidative stress, if you can do that, if you can reduce those two things, you will age optimally. There will be less of what we are now calling non-communicable chronic diseases, we'll talk about that later, you have better brain function, better heart function, a better life. You'll interact with your family better, you'll interact at work better, you'll function better, there will be less presenteeism, and life will just be better. So one of the easiest ways to achieve this is the Mediterranean diet, or some people call it the Mediterranean eating pattern. So what are the components of this and how do you achieve your best life? It's really an eating pattern is probably the best way to go about it because it's not a super strict diet per se. Uh, and there's actually three components to this lifestyle. The main feature really is stress reduction because stress is the problem. And then the Mediterranean diet lets you do that. And then exercise is a big component of this because exercise plays into improving the health of your mitochondria, reducing stress, and sort of just letting you be functional maintaining your muscle mass, balance, bone health, et cetera, so that you can age gracefully. Next slide. Hold, please. So Hippocrates, who you may know is from whom comes the Hippocratic Oath that we say when we all get our MD, 
Hippocrates, way back in the day, even knew. And he said, let food be your medicine and let medicine be your food. There is such a thing as functional food, functional diets. The Mediterranean diet is one of them. So why do we care about chronic inflammation? So chronic low-grade inflammation is the cause of most of our so-called lifestyle diseases. Effectively, what chronic inflammation does is it leads to poor mitochondrial health. What is a mitochondria? You may or may not know. Mitochondria is actually a portion inside of everybody's cell. So we have billions of cells that make us up. Each cell has a mitochondria in it. The mitochondria are actually the engine, the powerhouse, the fuel source. That is where your food is converted to usable functional molecules for your cell. So chronic inflammation destroys mitochondria, which effectively leads to low energy, which means none of the cell functions work right. In addition, the cell wall gets destroyed by the inflammation. So it's highly associated with oxidative stress, and oxidative stress is an abundant number of free radical species or unpaired electrons that are sort of just floating around in the cellular milieu, if you will, and then they attach to the membranes, destroy the membranes. They're sort of like, um, they're just like little attackers that just run around attacking things and damaging them. The reason you take antioxidants is they suck up those free radicals and neutralize them. So this image sort of shows you with an apple what oxidative stress does. So you start with a nice, healthy, firm fruit, well hydrated, and it sort of ends up brown, dry, wrinkled, disgusting, and it probably is mealy in texture. So for humans, one of the easiest ways to visualize oxidative stress is sort of what happens to the skin and the hair. Wrinkles pretty much show you what's been going on in your body for a long time, right? And you see this in the bottom picture, the free radical picture showing you the apple and the cell. So the cell wall, the nice beautiful lining of the cell, which we're about to talk about cell walls, gets holes punched in it, it gets stiff, it breaks, it just falls apart. Well, you might be thinking, well, who cares? What does that matter? Well, the cell wall is where everything happens. That's where all the receptors are. A lot of chemical reactions happen in the cell wall. Signaling uh, molecules and cytokines don't get to the nucleus to tell DNA what to do without going through the cell wall. So the cell wall is very, very important. Next slide. So chronic inflammation, oxidative stress. Promise we're going to get to the diet soon. What does it have to do with everything? It is a reason we have NCDs, non-communicable chronic diseases. So it's effectively what it sounds like. You can't catch them. You can just get them. Cardiovascular disease, ca cancer, obesity, insulin resistance. I would put in there pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, strokes, COPD, go on and on and on. These are all problems of stress, oxidative stress, chronic inflammation, lifestyle. If you look at the slide on the right, it shows you sort of a normal acute inflammatory response. Let's say you got injured, you were exposed to a virus, you got sick. Well, you want to have some inflammation. The whole purpose is to fight off pathogens, sequester them, destroy them, get them out of the system, promote healing, start the regenerative and proliferative processes. Well, what happens in chronic stress is you're, you're, you're consistently giving yourself uh, cytokines and oxidative stress is the pink lines. So you sort of have this low level of chronic numbers or high numbers of inflammatory cytokines and inflammatory problems, oxidative stress, free radicals, et cetera. So you're supposed to be where the yellow and black lines are way on the bottom, if not even lower. However, in a, most of us in America and now in most countries, you're really living in this sort of no man's land where you have a ton of oxidative stress and free radicals and chronic inflammation but it's not to the level that you get like when you have the flu, let's say, but it's not where it should be. This is where we don't wanna be, and this is why I want you on the Mediterranean diet and taking antioxidants, reducing inflammation, reducing stress. You wanna drop down to the black and white, I mean the black and yellow from the pink. So by definition, again, NCDs are non-infectious. You're not gonna catch diabetes from someone. They're non-transmissible. If you have diabetes, you can't give it to someone. They are associated, highly associated with low-grade chronic inflammation. Six out of 10 of the top causes of death worldwide are, are these non-communicable diseases. Now think about that. It is also the leading cause of disability. Back pain, number one cause, or one of the number one causes of disability in industrialized nations. Now there's a whole host of legal reasons why that's true, but the reasons back hurt, backs hurt is chronic stress. 
And the leading, leading cause of epigenetic damage. What are epigenetics? Well, this is when DNA is methylated and transformed even while you're in utero. And you can, and you can affect a child's life even before they're born by what you're eating. So around this green circle just sort of shows you who you are if you have the chronic low-grade inflammatory phenotype, which means type of person, uh, which can be changed. So sarcopenia disability, th these are the people that have no muscle mass when they get older, the, the little old ladies that are prone to falling because they're so weak. Frailty, people with atherosclerosis stroking out. Immunosenescent dysregulatory infectious, all that means is they have no immune system when you get older. Neurodegeneration, such as dementia, Alzheimer's, et cetera, cancer, anemia, depression, highly associated with oxidative stress and chronic inflammation in the brain, and of course, diabetes. So these are bad things. We don't want this in our lives. We want to optimally age, right? That's what I want to do. So I don't want an NCD if I can help it. So I know that I'm usually in a pro-inflammatory state because I'm an American and I live in, you know, an area, you're breathing pollution, there's pollution in the water, there's plastics leaking chemicals out everywhere, you're using synthetic pans, everything is a chemical, you know, all food is factory made. So I'm always stressed at work, I'm sure everybody else is. So pro-inflammatory state. So what can I do to reduce this? Well, one of the ways in diet is to reduce your omega-6 load to omega-3 load. Now what is omega-6, omega-3? These are polyunsaturated fatty acids which are what go into the cell membrane. And it's important to know what's in your cell membrane because remember I told you the cell membrane does more than just surround a cell. It's actually the functional organ of a cell. So the cell membrane will actually release um, molecules that go enter into other chemical pathways uh, to make things like cytokines and inflammatory responses. So omega-6s go down a very bad pathway to create inflammatory cytokines that are damaging to you and create a lot of reactive oxygen species. The omega-3s are much better. This is why you want omega-3s in your life. So pro-inflammatory state, you've got a high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. You've got high levels of reactive oxygen species in your body because you don't have enough antioxidants in your system. Therefore, you have oxidative stress. And on top of that, you have a sympathetic tone overload. So the autonomic nervous system is the parasympathetic and sympathetic. Think fight or flight. So most of us are too much on the fight side. We're too stressed out. There's too much cortisol, too much steroids, too much activity. We're not parasympathetic enough. One of the reasons yoga is so awesome is it induces the activity of the parasympathetic system, slows your heart rate, reduces blood pressure, slows your stress down. You're not as hyped up with adrenaline. We need to balance the autonomic system. We need to balance our omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, and we need to balance our reactive oxygen spe uh, species load relative to our antioxidant load. So how does this play into our topic, the Mediterranean diet? Picture on the right here is from a Time Magazine cover back in the day of a Dr. Ansel Keys. He sort of brought this to the forefront with what's called the Seven Countries Study. And there's been a fair amount of controversy about this since then, but by and large, the general principles found from this study hold true. It was detailed a little bit later, and then it was popularized even later by some doctors out of Harvard. Again, not without controversy. There's been actually a bunch of papers written refuting it, but then there were papers written refuting the refutations. Um, and effectively, the data holds true because there have been many huge population-based studies since then that effectively have proven that for population health, Mediterranean diet is one of the best ways to achieve it. So what did he do? In the 1950s, really technically I think it was published 1958, all, all this gentleman did was he went into these countries and looked at what do they eat and how does it affect their lifestyle and their heart disease levels. Back in the 50s, we thought that you had to have a heart attack. It was just part of getting old. There was no way to modify that. Like it was definitely just gonna happen. Well, now we know it's not inevitable. Um, and how we found this out really started with Dr. Keyes in this study. So effectively, the seven countries are pictured on the bottom there. So it looked at the diet of various countries, particularly those around the Mediterranean Sea, and, if, and he found that there was a 10 times or a 10x or a 10-fold difference between heart disease in high-risk countries like Finland and the lowest-risk country like Crete, which is actually the best example of the quote-unquote Mediterranean diet. So these two graphs just show you as a diet increases in cholesterol and fat on the x-axis, 
so does your mortality and risk of heart disease go up on the y-axis. Pretty basic concept, which we now take for granted. But it was discovered, really, by this guy going in detail, going and interviewing people, talking to them about what they eat, and then connecting the dots with the morbidity and mortality data that he found on the ground in the field. And this is a huge piece of work um, that I think was pretty awesome and really sort of opened our eyes. Oh, okay. I'm going to field a question really quickly, if you don't mind, folks. Uh, the question was, what foods are high in omega-3? I'm going to get into that in a bit here, but think seafood, really. Brain food, like your mom told you, is fish. So um, what is a Mediterranean diet? So again, it originates from the diet that the countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea, especially Crete, Greece, Italy, etc. Focuses on whole grains, not highly processed white bread puffed up with air that you get at the grocery store. Fruits, vegetables, heavy on the vegetables. Lean poultry, okay, and then omega-3 rich fish. Now, some poultry is actually high in omega-3. It depends on the diet of the chicken, of course. Healthy fats, especially olive oil, and we're going to talk about that. You can eat red meat on this diet, so those of you that, you know, want to turn the TV off and don't look at me because I'm talking about a diet and you think I'm going to say don't eat a steak, you actually can have red meat periodically with this diet, probably once a month. The key to red meat is you want to get uh, grass-fed, organic. You just want to eat good meat that's not filled with pesticides, and you want a cow that had a decent diet. You don't want to eat a cow that had a crappy factory diet, if that makes any sense, because you are what you eat. So if you're going to eat red meat, make sure your red meat was eating well before it became red meat, if that makes sense. You want spices to, to flavor your food, not so much salt. And this is important not, because, not just because it reduces salt, but more that you're adding spices because spices are effectively medicine. They're herbs and they are just chock full of phytochemicals. Moderate alcohol is actually beneficial and there have been a hundred studies on alcohol, but more or less in general, alcohol follows the tenet of what we call hormesis, which is stress your system a little bit and become stronger. So a little bit of alcohol is actually better than no alcohol because you strengthen your system responding to it, uh, but it's also not it's better than taking too much, if that makes sense. So it's one to two glasses a day, depending on how big you are effectively. And then the real key is on the bottom, I think. Eat slowly, eat fresh local foods, farm to table, and have fun with your family and friends. Because you know what? At the end of the day, that's all that life is about. And you don't want to be stressed out about what you're eating and stressed out about a diet. Because if you're stressed out, your cortisol is up, your sympathetic is up, and you're still in oxidative stress. So what good is it? So the Mediterranean diet, again, remember the three principles, exercise, low stress, good diet. Don't forget the low stress part. I will. Next. Okay, so again, I love this diet as a physician because it's approachable. It's achievable. I know my patients can do this. I know it's good for me, it's good for my family and friends, and it's good for work life. And it absolutely works. We know this because it's been studied extensively. And I think it helps me help my patients become better people. It helps me help you become awesome. So again, go have fun with your family, exercise with your kids, go do some yoga, eat this diet because it's fun, it's tasty, and it, it's actually good for you. So it's been proven to be effective in treating cardiovascular disease, reducing the incidence of cancer, reducing the incidence of depression. Obviously, it reduces obesity. It's even been shown to help with asthma, cognitive decline, diabetes, erectile dysfunction. So the Mediterranean diet is higher in micronutrients and in omega-3s than most diets, okay? So this is the key. It's really the micronutrients in the omega-3s and olive oil, which we'll talk about next. So the omega-3 polyunsaturated fats control damaging harmful inflammation. Remember, there's inflammation in your body for a reason. You need some inflammation. It serves a role. What you don't want is to drop from the acute inflammation that serves the role of treating injury and disease and then goes away. You don't want to be in that group that has chronic inflammation that's really not doing anything but attacking your own cells. So on the left side of this slide shows you the pathway that omega-6 fatty acids go through in the arachidonic acid pathway producing inflammatory mediators. The right side is the omega-3s and their pathway. 
And the omega-3s down to the EPA and DHA, which is found in you know, brain foods like fish and whatnot, and the omega-3 fatty acids, those are sort of the breakdown products, it'll actually stop the arachidonic acid cascade of your omega-6s. So the more omega-3s you eat, the better, because it's going to reduce the bad effects of the omega-6s. Now, you do need some omega-6s. Our problem is we're at a 20 to 1 ratio on average in this country, and it should be 1 to 1. So omega-3s go down this whole chemical pathway and make these, an these anti-inflammatory prostaglandin mo molecules and leukotriene mo molecules. So it actually puts you into a very... Uh, happy, balanced state, if you will. The omega-6s are always producing attack molecules. Attack, attack, attack. That's what we don't want. So we want to reduce the incidence of, anti of cytokines that are pro-inflammatory. We want to make anti-inflammatory cytokines. That's why you want omega-3s. So here's a cell membrane. And I, I loved this picture. That's why I put it in there. It sort of shows you it's a double layer membrane, bilipid layer, okay? The blue funny looking thing is a receptor uh, or a pathway that lets things in and out of the cells to go to the nucleus and to talk to the DNA and also to go to the mitochondria. The fatty acids are attached to the, the balls there and that little structure is a lipoprotein, right? And then that makes your lipid bilayer of the wall. And that, that's what's around your every cell in your body. The omega-3s are awesome for a couple reasons. We showed you one where it makes the anti-inflammatory pathway, but two, they're more flexible, literally more flexible than omega-6s. So the cell membranes are more flexible and everything works better when it's more flexible. You know this, when you get stiffer, like let's say your knee's arthritic, your hip's arthritic, your back, and you can't even get out of a chair because you're so stiff, you're not working so well. Once you loosen that up, you get everything flexible, you get a little bit stronger, all of a sudden everything works better. The cells are no different. So the cell membrane, and when it's flexible, it's more permeable. The receptors work better. It accepts more um, messengers. And um, the nuclear uh, substance or structures, I, sh I should say, inside the cell function better because they're getting the messengers they need. They need. So the omega-3s keep everything flexible, and they make the correct inflammation or cytokines that are anti-inflammatory versus pro-inflammatory. So the cell membrane is important in reducing inflammation. We talked about that, or at least getting us to the right type of inflammation. It also reduces oxidative stress, because if you have strong um, antioxidant ability of a cell membrane, you can neutralize free radicals just with the cell membrane structures and functions. And then you're, uh, if you're rich in omega-3s and your cell membrane is letting things go through to the nuclear area where the DNA is and the RNA, you can actually effectively modify your genetics and have better epigenetics. So how does, this, how does the diet do this? Well, we know that it reduces the risk of developing chronic illness, the, the NCDs and not incommunicable diseases like we talked about. We think it does it because it fills nutritional holes that we have. So we're missing a whole bunch of vitamins, minerals, cofactors, and antioxidants. You can replace these with this awesome diet if you follow it, if you adhere to it. Now, again, remember at the beginning, I said it's very hard to adhere to this diet uh, if you're super busy. Um, so in that case, you will have to supplement. But in general, this is a great place to start. This has been promoted by the American Heart Association, the World Health Organization, the American Diabe Diabetes Association, the list goes on and on, because it is so effective and it is approachable. Oh, we have questions. Go ahead. Yeah, you can get some omega-3s from hemp, flax. There are different ways to get it uh, from vegetable sources. Probably one of the best sources is seaweed. So if you can stomach eating seaweed, that is going to be your best source of my uh, omega-3s. Omega-9s are olive oil, and we're about to talk about that. Omega-6, you don't have to worry about getting that because almost everything you buy at the grocery store is chock full of omega-6. If you have been told they have a low fiber diet, no, because this diet has a lot of fresh vegetables, whole grains, fresh fruits, and all of those are very high in fiber, which is another reason it's good for heart health. So this would not be the best low fiber diet. All right. 
So let's talk about macro and micronutrients. Remember I told you the Mediterranean diet has a lot of micronutrients. Obviously it has your macronutrients too. Macro is big, micro is tiny. So the macronutrients are your proteins, your fat, your alcohols, your carbohydrates, your fiber. This picture on the bottom, the yellow globules, that, those are fat cells. So that's sort of a highly magnified picture of what we don't want a lot of in our body. The micronutrients are your vitamins, your minerals, your phytochemicals. Phyto is the beginning of a word that denotes from plant. So you want a ton of plant-based chemicals in your diet. So the Mediterranean diet is filled with micronutrients. You get enough of your macronutrients, but the real beauty of this diet is you don't have a lot of this, factory foods. So you can avoid processed foods, which I think is one of the real benefits of this diet because this diet promotes local food, farm to table, making your own food, eating with friends and family at home. You don't want to be going and eating factory food, okay, that's been highly deconstructed, reconstructed, enriched. So enriched white bread, why do they say enriched? Well, because during the processing process of making white bread, they take out everything that's possibly beneficial about a grain, and then they add some of it back in at the end with, like, extracts. So that's why it's enriched. So that's not so good. Processing, pasteurizing, homogenizing, ultra-preservation, irradiation of food, mass-produced, deconstructed and rebuilt, at the end of the day, this kind of food is effectively just a calorie vehicle. There is no micronutrient value, no antioxidant value, really no nutritional value except for calories and maybe some macronutrients. This is the real problem, one of the real sources of oxidative stress, and one of the reasons I really like the Mediterranean diet, because you really try to stay away from processed and especially ultra-processed foods. So there's ultra-processed, processed, minimally processed. We want to be over by minimally processed or not processed at all. Next slide. Okay, so I put this slide up because I was at a lecture once and I remember, can't remember her name, but she called it frankenfood and I just, that really stuck with me. You want to stay away from frankenfoods. These are not real foods. They are monster foods. Uh, they have hydrogenated oils. They have high fructose corn syrup which, oh, by the way, the FDA approved years ago and thought it was a great thing. And now all of a sudden everybody's backtracking and saying, oh, oops, maybe we weren't so right about that. High fructose corn syrup is one of the worst things in the world you can eat. Flavoring agents, coloring agents, emulsifiers, stuff that makes food very tasty, very rewarding. It actually induces endorphins in your brain, dopamine, and gives you the same um, sort of positive feedback loop that like gambling does or gaming. Um, and it's these kind of foods are available constantly. They're available easily. They're everywhere and they promote overconsumption. It's actually a great article out of the New York Times I, I referenced here, The Extraordinary Science of Addictive Junk Food. This is by design. All of this food was designed to make you want it more and more and more. So you need to just sort of stay out of the trap of highly processed foods. We have a question. Okay, well, that's a great question. Uh, probably one thing you could do is, and I know it sounds trendy and very millennial, but you, the avocado toast trend is actually a good thing. If you get really good whole grain bread, put olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, and avocado, and then maybe like an organic cage-free egg, that is a great healthy Mediterranean diet breakfast. You really could have fruits and vegetables for breakfast. Coffee is a great thing. Coffee is highly antioxidant and great for your brain. So I'm a big fan of coffee. And remember, milk is minimally processed. So if you need to put milk in your coffee, that's fine. I put agave in my coffee because I, I like agave because it's got a lower glycemic index. comes straight out of the agave plant, but it's actually very sweet and it makes things taste really good. So there's a number of ways to, to have a good breakfast with a Mediterranean diet. I mean, lox is a great way, right? So lox and capers. Oatmeal, of course, is a brilliant way to have a good Mediterranean breakfast. But I would probably not suggest Lucky Charms or bunny bread. And I used to love Lucky Charms. Now I really try to stay away from them. Next. And the next slide. Okay.
So I put this slide in here as sort of my example of a couple things. The beauty of American ingenuity and how horrible highly processed foods are. So this is the Cheeto. The Cheeto is one of the most addictive, best tasting foods ever. I love them. Who does not love Cheetos? But it is one of the most highly engineered foods known to man. This is directly from their website. Cornmeal is pumped through a pneumatic tube from silos hundreds of yards away. Then a food grade extruder is used. It's put into a massive feed hopper. It goes through the extruder. The heaters melt the cornmeal. They go through a turning screw. Then it goes into a shaping die to get the shape. After it's extruded, it's fried. Then it's left to cool. And I'm sure it's not fried in extra virgin olive oil, by the way. After it's cooled, they spray it with the desired seasoning. That seasoning was engineered to have the perfect five uh, taste in the exact same or the exact ratio and mix that will make your brain want more and more. So salty, sweet, sour, unami, and bitter. It's all perfectly balanced so that you will never not want another Cheeto. And then after it's seasoned, it's traveled a little bit longer and then it's packaged in plastic. Every 30 minutes, people come in to test the batch and make sure it's good. So it's a beautiful industrial process, right? It makes an awesome tasting food. But at the end of the day, this is Franken food. This is not on the Mediterranean diet. So let's talk about the science of the Mediterranean eating pattern or the Mediterranean diet. Again, supported both by the American Diabetic Association and the American Heart Association. Focuses on high quality food choices, farm to table, local, Organic, if you can do it, avoid pesticides. Try to stay away from meats that have a lot of hormones in it. Try to stay away from meats that are fed rendered products, i.e. cannibalized. Um, and try to stay away from fish that are farm-raised because they tend to be fed a lot of cornmeal and then they have less omega-3s. There's the PREDIMED study, the CARDIA study, a 2015 meta-analysis, okay? I'm just gonna go through these briefly. The PREDIMED study was like, I don't know, 7,000 people they looked at. And they looked at three groups, and at the end of the day, they found that changing the foods more towards the Mediterranean diet or the Mediterranean eating pattern can reduce the risk of diabetes by over 50%, even if you don't lose weight. Um, and then the Cardia study showed that early life fitness, so like if you did a lot of sports as a kid and you were real fit, that's better at the end of the day than converting to the Mediterranean eating pattern because it sort of establishes patterns in your cells and trains your mitochondria but the Mediterranean eating pattern is far better than doing nothing or you know, just staying on the same old lifestyle. So let's say you didn't play a lot of sports in the day, you could still get better and have better aging if you start eating this way now. And then a 2015 meta-analysis, which is just when they look at every study that's been written up to that point that meets their criteria, they effectively found a very significant reduction in hemoglobin A1C, which you may remember from my talk on diabetes, A1C, gives you a number that tells you the average level of your daily blood sugar for the three months up to that blood test. So significant reductions of A1C if you follow the diet and a 23% reduction of ever developing diabetes mellitus type two if you adhere to the Mediterranean eating pattern. So I put these two pictures sort of show, maybe don't get your food at the Circle K or the gas station if you can help it because that's gonna be low quality food, highly processed. Try to go to Whole Foods, which I know some people call Whole Paycheck, but really just try to go to the farmer's market wherever you can to get Whole Foods that are not processed and hopefully more vegetables. Next slide. So I put this picture to show you how beautiful this diet can be. These are good foods. They're fun to eat. They're tasty. It's not like telling you you can only eat cottage cheese for the rest of your life, okay? Or whatever those other crazy diets are. Um, these are wonderful foods that have been around since time began that man has loved and eaten on purpose before they even knew how good they were for you. Okay, and so let's talk about the fats. So there's a lot of controversy in the diet world and the health world and you know all the different books that come out about fats. Are there really healthy fats? I personally think yes. Obviously, your body needs fat. The brain is pretty much all fat, okay? Cell membranes are fat. Like, we have to have fat. You have to have cholesterol. The problem is oxidation of the fat, okay? When you have the fat that gets oxidized because of oxidative stress, then it becomes a foam cell, then it becomes an atherosclerotic plaque, then it becomes a stroke or a heart attack. You can't oxidize your fats. But fats in and of themselves are decent if they're decent fats, so if they're good olive oil. 
If it's good polyunsaturated fatty acids from like fish, like salmon or sardines or herring, if it's from flax, from hemp seed, what you don't want are highly processed fats or bad vegetable fats like from corn oil. Um, and even though a very well-marbled steak might be delicious, that's not a really healthy fat. So what makes a fat healthy versus unhealthy? Well, here we just talked about a Mediterranean breakfast. Here's one of your best fats ever, avocado. And also avocado has a very high um, smoke point of note. So it's a, it's a real good olive, I'm, I'm sorry, it's a real good oil to cook with because it's, um, it's not gonna denature while you're cooking with it. So the best healthy fat, by far, extra virgin olive oil. Then avocado oil, and I'm, I probably shouldn't be ranking these. Definitely extra virgin olive oil is the best, but the rest can sort of fall in line. Fatty acid rich fish like salmon and trout, some coconut oils, and I'll show you in a slide later, coconut oils are pretty saturated, but the medium chain triglycerides in the coconut oils are good. And the, and the fats you find in um, nuts, like almonds and walnuts and whatnot. Next slide. What? Oh. So talk about fats real quick, because I know a lot of people don't really know what we're saying when we say saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated. This comes down to your organic chemistry, okay? The saturated fats are very stable, solid at room temperature. This is the stick of butter you leave out and it never melts. Animal fats, tropical oils. So at the molecular level, every carbon bond is occupied by hydrogen. They're very stiff molecules. They pack in tightly and then they, they, they don't have the flexibility, they don't ever become liquid until you melt them. Monounsaturated, these are liquid at room temperature, but they solidify when they're cold. They only have one double bond. Okay, so two carbon ad, atoms that are double bonded together. They cannot pack as tightly as the saturated fats, they can become looser. Polyunsaturated, two double bonds, okay? And they don't pack together even when they're refrigerated. So these are the, the, the oils that stay liquid even when they're cold. So polyunsaturated, so the unsaturated part, saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, that has to do with the chemical bonds that are allowed in the molecule itself. So bad fats, like I said before, are actually oxidized fats. So the bottom, the top one shows you um, sort of a H&E stain picture of adipose cells or fat cells. Under that shows you the process of the creation of what's called a foam cell, which is the beginning of the placking that happens in arteries. So when you have coronary artery, artery disease, the top right shows you what happens. So before you have coronary artery disease, all of your vessels are a nice wide open tube, blood goes in and out, no problem. When you get coronary artery disease, all of a sudden it shrinks. You have a tiny tube. Why? Because the intimal lining or the lining of the vessel got filled with foam cells from atherosclerosis. These get calcified, and then all of a sudden you went from a nice, flexible, beautiful tube to bring blood to a stiff, damaged, narrow aperture tube that doesn't get blood to where it's supposed to go. Thus, you have things like heart attacks and strokes. So omega-3s reduce the incidence of this. They don't let the foam cells happen. They reduce the, uh, the thrombotic action, so they reduce blood clots and the ability to sort of pack in there, and they keep the flexibility, and again, they reduce the oxidative stress that makes the fat cells oxidated to begin with. So the LDL that you always hear about, low density lipoprotein, that's bad when it gets oxidized. Omega-3 can prevent that. So the primary protein in the Mediterranean diet is fish or shellfish. And this is where your omega-3s come from. Shrimp, uh, oysters, redfish, and you can tell I'm in Louisiana, grouper, um, cod, I guess, from up north. So fish, basically. You want brain food. You don't want farm-raised fish if you can help it unless you know what they're feeding the farm fish. Uh, red meat once a month, grain-fed organic. Olive oil should be your primary fat. And when I say olive oil, not your cheapest olive oil you find on the shelf because that's effectively just oil that they've sort of added back some coloring and fla flavoring to make it smell like olive oil. You need virgin olive oil or, better yet, extra virgin olive oil. Some dairy products are okay. Why? Because again, on the continuum of processing, they're closer to the minimally processed. I'm not talking about, um, oh my gosh, I can't even think of it. What's that processed cheese stuff that you make the casseroles with? Yeah, I'm not talking about Velveeta. Velveeta is a highly processed cheese product. I'm talking about your real good blue cheeses, your real good cheddars, 
uh, things that are low processed, minimally processed. And again, the diet reduces the risk of oxidized, low density lipoproteins, so the cell membranes work better, they function better, you don't get the foam cells, you don't get the placking. There's actually been a lot of studies looking at the Mediterranean diet versus low fat diets or high carb diets or whatever, name a diet, they've studied them against each other. It's actually been better results for population health than even low fat diets. Again, controversy there because there's always gonna be randomization problems or adherence problems or survey uh, truthfulness response problems, et cetera, et cetera. But basically there's a much better ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 lower ratio, closer to the one-to-one -one where we should be based on evolution, as opposed to where we are in America, which is 20 to one. So everything is just more flexible, less stress, good inflammation, no bad inflammation, no foam cells, fewer reactive oxid oxidized species. Now this is what I talked about before. This is a chart showing you different components of different oils, okay? The light color is oleic acid, which is omega-9. That is a monounsaturated fat. The dark purple is your saturated fats. The pink, your polyunsaturated fats. So the top, you would think, oh, I should eat safflower oil. Look at that. Well, the problem with safflower oil is it's highly processed. So it's rendered in a factory. Um, so I'd probably stay away from that. Extra virgin olive oil is your friend, will always be your friend. And then you go down the line, okay? Uh, Coconut oil, remember I told you it's got a lot of solids. You wanna be on the, the medium chain triglyceride side. So this just sort of shows you your PUFAs versus your MUFAs versus your saturated fat. And then you wanna stay away from the highly saturated and you really want a lot of the oleic acid or alpha linoleic acid versus linoleic acid, sort of a tongue twister. Alpha linoleic acid becomes the good part of the inflammatory chain linoleic acid becomes the bad part. So try to, if there's one thing you can do to be closer to the Mediterranean diet, start just using extra virgin olive oil and throw all your other oils out, would be my advice. Don't eat processed white food and try to avoid Cheetos. Yeah, and chicken, so poultry. I love poultry, a lot of people love poultry. It's really hard to eat seafood all the time, first of all, it's expensive. Second of all, it's hard to cook it where it tastes good correctly unless you've got some sort of culinary degree. But chicken is approachable. We all love chicken. So if you're going to eat chicken, cook it in olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. Use a lot of spices. Don't use so much salt. Don't cover it with gravy. Um, have a good side of some good vegetables. And then just make sure the chicken you buy is good chicken. Grass-fed, organic, you know, not made from some massive factory in the middle of the country and processed in a factory in the south and then packaged and thrown out to every grocery store. Try to go to your local butcher really would be your best bet. Or if you have a family friend that has a chicken farm and they're willing to sell you some, that's your best source. And then Whole Foods, places like that, that really, and you know, I love Whole Foods because they really pay attention to the provenance of their meats. So if you ask them, they will tell you exactly where that meat came from and what that animal was fed prior to becoming meat. Oh, I said grain fed, sorry, I meant grass fed. Yeah, oops, thank you. I meant grass fed meats. <laughs> Okay, so here's the nutshell of the Mediterranean diet. 2,200 kilocalories a day on average, three to nine servings of vegetables, half to two servings of fruit. So look at that ratio. You need to be eating more vegetables than fruit. One to 13 servings of cereals, and by cereals we mean whole grains, okay, not enriched processed white flour, and up to eight servings of olive oil, again, extra virgin if possible. If you do that, then you will have a 40% drop in your risk of death from cardi cardiac disease, from MI, which is heart attack, from stroke. That was shown in the MACE study. You will have better blood pressure. Your lipid profile will be better. Your lipoprotein profile will be better. You will have less inflammation. You will have less oxidative stress, and you will have less atherosclerosis. This was shown after just five years of this diet. And then if you even have a genetic risk, like let's say everybody in your family died young of heart attack, you adopt this style, diet, you reduce your personal risk by 50%. Significant drops in CRP, which a lot of you may know when you go see a physician now, they check your CRP levels to see what your heart attack risk is. 
that's chronic reactive protein. It's a, it's a little protein made in your liver that in, indicates inflammation. They'll check a highly sensitive CRP to see if you're living in that chronic inflammation stage, or at least they should be checking. Uh, they might even check your IL-6, interleukin-6. Remember on that inflammatory cascade, omega-6, omega-3, the IL-6 is a bad one, and that goes up with um, inflammation. So this diet reduces all of that, and it's yummy. Okay, we have a question about shrimp. Uh, the question is, I heard shrimp was bad for cholesterol. Is that true? I would say no, because people in the Mediterranean diet have been eating shrimp forever and do better than most of us. The problem with shrimp, I think, is most of it's fried when we eat it or served with some sort of sauce that's not so good for you. But just basic good shrimp that's wild caught, again, not farm raised, um, is very high in omega-3s. It has some fats in it, right? But remember, fat is not necessarily bad in and of itself. You want good fats of the polyunsaturated type, and you want a diet that reduces oxidative stress that will convert your LDL to oxidized LDL. That's the real problem. Thank you, Miss Eva. Now, here's the other beauty of the Mediterranean diet, hydration. So you probably watched the Super Bowl and you probably heard about Tom Brady and how healthy he is. He drinks his body weight, I think, some ratio of his body weight in water every day. Hydration really is a key to health. The beauty of the Mediterranean diet, if you're eating that three to nine servings of vegetables and two servings of fruit a day, is you're hydrating just by eating. So then you add some really good green tea with a bunch of antioxidants or even black tea uh, and coffee and then water, and you're really doing yourself a ton of favors. Look at these foods. Blueberries, 95% of a blueberry is water. How awesome is that? And the other 5% is massive levels of antioxidants. Okay, so good for you. Celery, 95% water. The other 5% filled with iron and, and fiber. So I could go on and on. But the, this diet is good for you in so many different ways. It's, you know, that we're just touching on it. I have a question. This, okay, the, the question is about butter. Is saturated fat considered bad? Some saturated fat is okay, as long as you're not only living on saturated fat. So in general, butter is bad, but butter is probably better for you than highly processed fake fats, uh, as long as you're eating it in moderation. Everything in moderation, even moderation. But I would say try to avoid butter if you can and just eat olive oil. So if you can, if you can um, for instance, popcorn. I love popcorn. I pop my popcorn in olive oil because I love it that way. I never use butter and I don't put butter on it. So, but every now and then butter is good. You want butter. Remember the other tenant of this diet is low stress and happiness, okay? And enjoying life. So I'm not saying try to be ridiculously strict about this, but in general, if you had to choose between extra virgin olive oil and butter, I would pick olive oil every day, nine, nine times out of 10. Yeah, so for instance, shrimp scampi, okay? This is one of my favorite foods. So I try to, I, I kind of modified my shrimp scampi now, where first of all, everything's organic if I can do it. We do it with extra virgin olive oil, and instead of adding butter, guess what I add? Avocado oil. It tastes exactly the same, much better for me. And I use whole wheat organic pasta. Okay, so let's talk about the micronutrients of olive oil. This is one of the reasons olive oil, besides being a monounsaturated fat, that kickstarts a bunch of very healthy cascades in your body. Olive oil, the extra virgin olive oil, is chock full of polyphenols, okay? It is antioxidant in and of itself. These polyphenols are on the right, estradiol, hydroxychamoxifen, oleic acid, oleopurin, sorry, oleoropian, I can never say that word, hydroxytyrosol. These are all just phytochemicals. Remember I told you you need a bunch of phytochemicals. Olive oil has it, it just has it. So you're already adding these to your diet if you're eating extra virgin olive oil. You get healthier DNA repair, which means what? Less mutations, less cancer. Fewer mitochondrial defects, which means what? Your cells have more fuel, better energy, they function better. Reduced aging factors, 
membrane stability. Remember the cell membrane? Less inflammation, and if you do have inflammation, it's good inflammation. Prevents angiogenesis or new blood cells forming where they're not needed. Improves endothelial function, that's the lining of your vessels. Antithrombotic, reduces the ability to form unnecessary clots like DVTs and whatnot. And then some people believe it to be anti-cancer in and of itself. The micronutrients in olive oil and in the vegetables of the Mediterranean diet and the spices is really one of the keys. We have a question. Uh, question is, what about venison? So venison is what I would call a healthy red meat. So game is not processed, it's wild caught, right? Remember I said before to get your wild caught fish, your wild caught shrimp? Think of game as your wild caught red meat, right? It's lower in fat because they're healthier. They eat a more natural and more varied diet because they're just out in the woods eating as opposed to cows that are fed a certain ratio of factory food, plus often given antibiotics on a daily basis. So it's just more natural meat, lower in fat. And I think, what, oh, 50 percent less fat than beef. There you go. Um, so if you can tolerate game, if you like game and you want red meat, if you could switch entirely to deer once a month instead of cow, I mean, well, now we're talking. That's a good diet. I'm not saying every day, though because I'm sure there's somebody out there watching this that just heard me say, eat red meat. That was a great question, Linda. Next. Okay, so again, olive oil, super chock full of micronutrients. In fact, up to 1,000 milligrams per kilogram of olive oil is just polyphenols. And phenols are one of the subclasses of the phytochemicals, okay? There's terpenoids, there's monoterpenoids, triterpenoids, there's antithiocins, there's phenols. So we're full of phenols, okay? These prevent oxidation of the oil in and of itself. So you know how some oils get rancid? Well, that's the oil oxidizing. That means the oil has oxidized itself and become that oxidized oil that we don't want in our bodies. The extra virgin olive oil doesn't do that because it's already got a bunch of antioxidants in it. And in fact, that makes it safer to cook with, assuming you never hit the smoke point. And it reduces your membrane susceptibility to peroxidation, which is peroxidation is when the membrane becomes damaged and releases those electrons, those free radical species, um, and oxidative stress. So basically, olive oil is actually more efficient in reducing oxidative stress in the body than corn or fish oil. And there is an inverse relationship between how much olive oil you eat along with other antioxidant rich foods and how many diseases you have. So if you eat a lot of antioxidants or take a lot of antioxidants and your diet is primarily extra virgin olive oil, you're gonna have that many fewer diseases than other people. So how does it reduce the stress? Again, the, the polyphenols we talked about, oleocanthal, oleuropene, it's got the omega-9 omega oleic acid, the monounsaturated fat. And then because of the combination of the phytochemicals and the monounsaturated fat component, reduces inflammation, reduces the low-density lipoprotein cholesterol levels, which, again, are bad when they get oxidized, lowers your blood pressure. It's actually been shown to clear beta amyloid plaques in the brain, which helps fight neurodegeneration. And it picks up and neutralizes free radicals. So it's actually antioxidant, like we talked about, which reduces oxidative stress, which reduces neuroinflammation, reduces wrinkles. This is a primary component in a lot of natural skincare products. Helps your heart, helps your blood vessels, helps you stronger, helps your bone health. We have a question. What do I recommend? Oh, for beef, so this diet says you can eat red meat once a month. Now, should you have 12 meals with red meat yearly? That's not really the recommendation. It's more if you have to, you can, and it's, it's fine. Your body has enough goodness in it and ability to fight off whatever's bad in that red meat that you'll be okay. The problem comes with people that eat red meat every day, right, or worse, more than one meal every day and even worse, bad red meat that they fry, okay? That's just horrifying if you think about it. So if every now and then you wanna have a really good grass-fed organic steak that's cooked well um, and enjoy it with your family and friends after you've eaten really well for the rest of the month and you're having kale and whatnot with it, that's okay. Do I recommend it? Like, is that my, like, like a diet checkbox? No, 
But if you eat red meat once a month, I think it's fine. Okay, this is this is a great Louisiana question I just got. What do I think about using turkey tasso? What was the other one? Or chicken sausage to flavor beans? I think versus um, ham hocks, which is how traditionally people flavor white beans and red beans in the South. I think if you're using that in lieu of using the ham, the ham hock, yes, that's better. Turkey tasso is probably better than the chicken sausage because too often the chicken sausage has additive pork and added a bunch of saturated fats. I would use the turkey tasso, which people in the North and watching us from around the country may not know what that is. I'm not exactly sure how they make tasso, but it's yummy. <laughs> yeah, turkey, just make sure it's, you know, from a high quality manufacturer or farm um, and not highly processed. Look at the ingredients. This is another rule of thumb. If it's five or less, you're probably sort of safe when you buy foods. If you've got like a list of like 20 ingredients, maybe, maybe you don't want that. That might be highly processed. So let's talk some more about flavonoids and micronutrients after this next question. Okay. The question is, do I have a comment about the paleo diet di versus Mediterranean? Yeah, so this diet, I would have to find and read the study before I commented on it too specifically, but... The Mediterranean diet has been put head to head with almost every diet out there. I think for certain people, the paleo diet is recommended for certain conditions. And if you have a doctor recommended paleo diet because you have, I don't know, whatever disease they're trying to treat, of course I'm not gonna say switch to Mediterranean. In general, I think the Mediterranean is better than paleo because the paleo diet, you're not really getting all the micronutrients I think that you probably really need in the phytochemicals and certainly not the fiber that you would really want until you get to the more vegetable side of it, I guess. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to do the Atkins diet. It's hard to be paleo. It's hard to be keto. It's expensive. It's, it's unreal. Like if you go out to dinner with your friends at a restaurant, it's really hard to keep on that diet and, and not have everybody look at you funny. This diet is a great diet for socializing, for being out and about. You can stick to the Mediterranean diet almost everywhere you go. So the flavonoids and micronutrients, also found in the red wine. Remember this diet recommends uh, um, alcohol in moderation. So I think it's one to two glasses of wine a day. Tea, onions. Onions are a huge part of this diet, right? Onions are massively full of quercetin and other really good phytochemicals. Garlic, garlic reduces thrombotic events itself. Garlic has been known to be anti-cancer. Garlic is very good for you. Apples filled with fiber and quercetin. Fruits, berries filled with antioxidants. So several hundred grams of polyphenols in this sort of a diet per hundred grams of food. So the real key is getting the micronutrients, getting the omega-3s and the omega-9, reducing your stress, and like having a good life. This diet, okay, I was gonna say this diet is, the real key is protective against oxidized fats, okay? We need some fats, we need it for brain health. You just don't want oxidized fats. So next. Okay, some myths about the diet. I've heard it's expensive. Well, it's really not expensive if you think about it in a big picture, and I haven't, we'll talk about it a little bit later. But compiling fresh ingredients for this diet is actually less expensive at the end of the day than buying all of your food in a processed fashion. Organic is better, but if you can't buy organic because it's a little bit ex more expensive, that's okay because any vegetable is better than no vegetable. So if your choice is organic vegetable, vegetable, no vegetable, pick vegetable if you can't afford organic, don't pick no vegetable. Does that make sense? So any vegetable is better than no vegetable. So you don't have to spend on organic. I do because I don't want pesticides and whatnot, but not everybody can, I get that. But still, the more vegetables you eat, the better. Large quantities of whole grains and wine are perfectly acceptable in this diet. That's not so true. It's really moderate. Moderation on the wine, moderation on the cereals and the whole grains, okay? Up to one cup of pasta and grain, brown rice, whole grain pasta, low glycemic index things. And then if you can't get the um, 
resveratrol that you're supposed to get out of the red wine and the grapes of this diet, then take some resveratrol, okay? It's so good for your brain. It's so good for mitochondrial health. It's actually the anti-aging molecule. And resveratrol has actually been shown to mimic at the mitochondrial level, the same effect of calorie restriction, which we know prolongs life. And then another myth, the diet focuses on eating and nothing else. That's not true. Remember, I've been telling you throughout this talk, you want to exercise and you want to spend time with your friends and you want low stress, you want to socialize. So this diet focuses on just a general way of being, sort of a happy life. And then that reduces your stress levels, right? If you don't have to stress about, am I going to be able to eat keto when I go out with my friends tonight? Or am I going to be able to, you know, limit my calories to five calories at this meal? If you're not stressed about that stuff all the time, you'll be happier and have less oxidative stress on your brain too. So who should consider this diet? Definitely people with high blood pressure. Definitely diabetics. Definitely those with a genetic risk of heart attack or cardiac art disease. Anyone that wants to be healthier, anyone that wants to age well. And then that leaves us to really probably everybody should consider this diet. Now, like I said, it's not without its controversy, and it may not be for you. And some people have very specific conditions that need very specific diets. I get that. I'm not trying to say this is the panacea and it's going to cure all of life's problems. But by and large, this is an awesome diet for generalized good health that is achievable. Okay, this is a very specific question about types of fish and is it as good as crepey something, which I don't know, and bluegill versus salmon, brim. Salmon has one of the highest levels of omega-3 of all fish, but you know what fish really have the highest levels? Sardines and herring. But I don't see a lot of us eating sardines and herring. So what I would tell you to do, which is what I do, is I take omega-3 every day. I supplement 2,000 milligrams a day of omega-3. Um, but the other thing about salmon is a lot of it now is farm-raised. It's not wild-caught, so be aware of that. So if you're getting fresh-caught, wild-caught brim versus farm-raised salmon, that might be better. There's so many nuances to what we eat today because of the food industry. You really just sort of have to look at every part of it and then make your decision. So if you are healthy, let's say you're healthy and, and you're thin and you're just watching this because you're bored this morning. You're like, well, I don't need to do this. I'm fine. I can eat my Cheetos. If you eat the Mediterranean diet, if you adopt it now, you have an 85% lower chance of ever getting diabetes. Now look at the map on the right. The dark purple shows you where there's a bunch of obese children running around. How scary is that? We already probably have in our middle school population in this country, probably 20% of them are pre-diabetic. I mean, it is bad childhood obesity and it is getting worse. So if you can adopt this style for this diet for yourself and your family, you will be helping your kids. Kids all look healthy, right? But they're starting to form foam cells and atherosclerosis in the teenage years, well before you would even think to check for it. Studies have shown that. So I've read studies that say it is never too soon to start omega-3 supplements. So I give my kids omega-3. So you want to get on this diet as soon as possible because you want your brain to be as healthy as possible when you get older. You want your heart to be as healthy as possible. You do not want diabetes. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I do a lot of foot and ankle surgery, and I see what happens to people with diabetes. It is bad, and you want to avoid that if you can help it. Obesity kills more people than starvation. We always hear about and see the really sad commercials about starving kids. Well, the real truth of the world is fat is killing people more than starving is. More people are dying of obesity and non-communicable diseases related to diet and lifestyle than could ever die from starving. And it is a sad fact and it's depressing. This is a way to prevent that for you and your family. That's a question? Oh. Oh, yeah, there's a good brand if you want to start giving your kids omega-3s. They sell it uh, online, and also I, you can get it at Whole Foods called Barleen's. They make one that's mango, tastes mango-y, that actually kids like, and it gives them a, a good amount of EPA, DHA, which is good for their heart health um, and, and other brain health, obviously. <clears throat> Kids, 
Kim says that her son used to get sardines in his Christmas stocking because he loves him so much. I think that I'm going to try that this year. <laughs> Next. All right. Now, this is something when I was researching this talk I found out, which is interesting, something ironic for you to think about. Where is childhood obesity most prevalent in Europe? Come to find out, the Mediterranean countries. Why? Because they don't even follow their own diet now. They follow ours. Now that is sad. So the traditional Mediterranean diet is awesome, but these poor countries around the Mediterranean are trying to eat more like Americans, and therefore they're becoming fat when they're children and obese and getting diabetes and pre-diabetic, and it's not good. So this is an eating pattern, remember a lifestyle pattern, based on data and literature from the 1960s, late 50s. No one in the region apparently is really eating like this anymore. And I like to say that our best export is obesity. This is what America does best. And uh, we need to work on this and we need to start eating better, I think, um, for health. No other reason. I'm not saying anything about how anybody looks or anything about anybody personally, but the data is clear that if you have too many fat cells that produce inflammation, which adipose cells produce inflammation 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, your body is attacking itself with oxidative stress and chronic inflammation, and that is not healthy. And then most of our thoughts about this diet are from the 1950s, the seven country study, et cetera. If they went and looked at those regions now, we would not get the same information. That diet would be false if it was done today versus when it was done. Can you have too much omega-3 in your body? Uh, yes, but it would be really hard to achieve that. Um, you need omega-9, you need omega-6, you need omega-3. Our problem is our ratio of 6 to 3 is so skewed towards 6. You do want some. You want 1 to 1. That's your ideal ratio. Okay. Yeah, I take, two th I take 1,000 milligrams in the morning and 1,000 milligrams at night. Okay, now we live in an era of a pandemic, right? And we keep hearing, oh, uh, pre-existing condition, comorbidities, that's who gets COVID. 40% of the United States adults are susceptible to severe COVID because of underlying conditions. Number one being obesity, okay? 30% of our country, one out of three people is obese. Obese means a body mass index of 30 or more. Diabetes mellitus, at least 10%. They don't have pre-diabetes on this, but for every diabetic, there's probably two to three pre-diabetics out there. Pre-diabetes is probably a pre-existing condition. Heart disease, chronic kidney disease. The Mediterranean diet can help modify all of these to the betterment of the person on that diet, which effectively makes your immune system function better and, and gives you less of those so-called pre-existing conditions. Quick word on carbs and breads, because everybody talks about high carb, low carb, blah, blah, blah. I need to be on low carb, low carb, low carb. Well, really what you want are good carbs. Whole grains with lots of fiber, lots of phytochemicals, lots of other parts of the plant that are too often extracted out. The picture on the left comes from the website of Bunny Bread, which is sort of the wonder bread of the South, about their glorious history of manufacturing and factory. But basically what they've done, like most fast food restaurants in our country, is made a whole industry of destroying human bodies. Uh, and somehow that's celebrated, but that's the world we live in. The picture on the right is a flour mill that actually I have one of these. That you can take spelt, like whole grain spelt, whole grain barley, whatever you want, put it in your flour mill and make your own whole grains that's minimally processed and make your own bread with that. Now that takes a lot of time, obviously. But you just want to avoid the highly, it's, it's few highly processed grain products as you can get because... At the end of the day, your brain needs glucose. You do need carbohydrates. It is one of, you know, the main food groups. But you just don't want bad carbs that are highly processed, franken foods, and enriched. Yeah, I would avoid breads that have been made in a factory. Uh, maybe go to, like, your local bakery, or if anybody in your family bakes bread, that's the best way to do it. Um, and then avoid enriched. You don't need enriched. You want whole grain stuff. So basically, the Mediterranean diet is doable. It is possible. Anyone can do it. You can do it. 
put a shout out here to Chef John Fols, one of our best chefs in Louisiana, sitting in front of olive oil and vegetables, effectively the Mediterranean diet. Avoid frying your foods, avoid franken foods, avoid highly processed foods. Now, we don't all have personal chefs. We can't all follow these perfect diets with these perfect exercise routines with the exact ratio of water and like get our IV infusions of all of our antioxidants and then also have uh, our own hyper back our own hyperbaric oxygen machine in our house, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, these are three examples of what we all want to be. We want to be Tom Brady. We want to be Elle McPherson. She's 60 in that picture. We want to be J-Lo. She's 50 in that picture. We want to be these people, but we, I can't afford what they do. So the, cl the closest we're going to get and the healthiest we can be is a Mediterranean diet plus supplementing, I think, because at the end of the day, it's really hard to get all the phytochemicals and micronutrients you need. So let's talk about cost again, because that's a question I always get asked. The average American diet is supposedly $10 per day. The Mediterranean diet is $16 per day. That's according to the US News and World Report, OK? Now, 45% of Americans around the age of 65 with, with heart disease have financial hardship for medical bills. We always hear about, oh, medical bills make everybody bankrupt, blah, blah, blah. Well, what, the real way to save money on medicine is not get sick, right? There's another study that said those on the Mediterranean diet save about $750 a year over what the United States Dairy, uh, Dairy Association, or USDA, sorry, Dietary Association tells you what to eat. So if you follow what the USDA does, you're actually spending more than the Mediterranean diet. Now here's the real cost factor that you need to think about. People with heart disease typically have out-of-pocket health costs more than $2,000 a year. And more than half of that goes towards pills. So you tell me if spending on the Mediterranean diet is expensive or not. At the end of the day, if you can avoid diabetes, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer, oxidative stress, chronic inflammation, you're saving yourself money for, for like lifetime wealth. It might be more expensive on a cash flow basis daily, but if you're saving 2,000 bucks a year because you don't have heart disease, that's awesome. The lifetime cost of a less severe or a mild heart attack, $760,000. The lifetime cost of a severe heart attack, over a million. So if you have a heart attack, you've just lost that much wealth for you and your family. So if you really want to save money and grow family wealth and like be safe and feel secure, you got to take care of your health. And that's why I love the Mediterranean diet. Pair it with an active lifestyle. You don't have to run marathons. You don't have to do uh, CrossFit and all this other stuff. Do a little bit of yoga, go for a walk. That's all you have to do, okay? A little bit of exercise is better than none. Take a constitutional. It's probably one of the best things you can do. What is that? A walk after dinner. Eat earlier. It's another thing because if you eat earlier, you're effectively intermittently fasting at the same time. And then supplements. So I put this picture on the left because it's so horrifying. It's a deep fried double Big Mac thing. Okay, if that's your lifestyle, you definitely better be taking the stuff on the right, which is omega-3s. But ideally, you'll never put that thing on the left in your mouth. And then you'll still take the omega-3s. And that's your best bet. So low-grade inflammation, remember, we don't want that. We want to have no inflammation unless we have an infection and an injury. Then we want a big blast of inflammation to get better. Then we want to go back to nothing. So we want to avoid autoimmune disease. We want to avoid neurologic disease. We want to avoid neurologic aging. We want to avoid arthritis. We want to avoid lung disease, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular, cancer, diabetes. To do that, you have to reduce your oxidative stress and you have to reduce your inflammation. And this is a simple, easy, approachable way to start doing that for yourself and your family. We might have a question. Or not. Okay. So talking about... Okay, sorry. 
Okay, we're talking, there's some questions coming up about supplements, I think. So basically, like I told you, even though I know I should be eating three to nine servings, closer to the nine side, of vegetables a day, to, I try to eat at least an apple a day because it keeps the doctor away. But I don't eat enough vegetables, I know that. So I take supplements. I take all of these that you see here. These are all my supplements that I have designed because of what I know they're not getting. So CBD, you probably heard about it a lot. It's the non-psychoactive component of the cannabis sativa plant. Highly antioxidant, highly anti-inflammatory. Really good for you. The Brain Booster has lion's mane in it. Lion's mane has been shown to actually let brain cells regenerate. There's very few things that can do that. Tart cherry extract. Tart cherry does the same thing for you that Celebrex does without all the side effects. And it's massively antioxidant, and it naturally has melatonin, so it helps you sleep. The Herbal Immunity, Echinacea, Elderberry, Shisandra, Quercetin, Pine extract, all very pro-immune. And remember, inflammation is strongly related to your immune system's function. If you have a bad immune system, if your white blood cells don't function well, they will go easily into a cytokine storm, which is bad, and then they don't effectively fight off pathogens, also bad. You have to have a very finely tuned, very balanced immune system. That's why I take this herbal immunity, but also CBD has, there are actual receptors on leukocytes, white blood cells, for the CBD molecule to help balance them and get them functioning well. So, you know, even if you eat a perfect diet, I would say supplement with antioxidants because we are just surrounded by toxins in, in our industrial lifestyle. But uh, if you can't eat a perfectly antioxidant diet, definitely supplement. That's what I do. This is one I developed for peripheral nerve pain because I see it so often with my diabetic patients with neuropathy. And remember, neuropathy is just chronic inflammation that's damaged the nerve endings. And now they're completely dysfunctional and they hurt all the time. So all of the pills that are available for this either make people gain weight or sedate them too much. So I came up with this formula, which is very much for brain health and nerve health. PEA, palmitoyl ethanolamide, is a fatty acid amide that is on the good side of inflammation. It is a breakdown product that goes into the good pro-health anti-inflammatory cascade. PEA is produced naturally in your body whenever there's injury or stress because it's a way to fight that to get it balanced and get back to normal. Uh, chlorella, which is algae. Remember I told you if you can stomach seaweed, eat as much seaweed as you can because that's your best source of omega-3s. <clears throat> Excuse me, have my coffee. Luteolin, another wonderful antioxidant, awesome for the brain and for nerves. N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine is being used now in a lot of mental health diseases. People are studying N-acetylcysteine to reduce inflammation and in overactive nervous systems for things ranging from ADHD to Alzheimer's. I mean, that is an awesome brain molecule and nerve molecule. My favorite, of course, is resveratrol because that is a so-called long life molecule. Very anti-aging, mimics calorie restriction, massively antioxidant. And then your omega-3s. And in this one, it's I put a higher ratio of DHA to EPA. DHA is a component that's more involved in cell membrane structure and function. EPA is more involved in signaling and uh, the cascades. So I was more interested in membrane health and membrane flexibility. All of these things are to supplement. Now, should you supplement only? No. Should you have a perfect diet and eat like Tom Brady? Yes. But most of us can't do that because life gets in the way and money gets in the way. So I just do the best I can and supplement. Uh, and hopefully you guys will switch to at least fewer highly processed foods, more extra virgin olive oil, take a walk after dinner, enjoy your family and friends, everything in moderation, but just try to eat more vegetables, try to be more like the Mediterranean region in the 1950s. I got a question. Here's, Here's a question. So this is somebody who bought the Healing Soul, so thank you, and is on Mobic. Mobic is a COX-2 inhibitor, right? It's, I don't know if you remember the original picture of the inflammatory cascades. Well, the arachidonic acid from the cell membrane gets converted by cyclooxygenase 1 or cyclooxygenase 2 to the next molecules, which are the prostaglandins that are actually the cytokines that do the damage. So the COX-2 inhibitors supposedly only inhibit the cyclooxygenase 2, 
which doesn't change your stomach acid functionality and supposedly reduces the incidence of bleeding ulcers, right? That's why Celebrex, Vioxx, Mobic, that's why they were all invented. Now, they do have cardiac side effects, come to find out. So you may wanna, if you have a heart history, you should always check with your doctor about any anti-inflammatory you're on because they all affect heart function. Heart cherry does the same thing that the COX-2s do, but is completely natural and much healthier. There's a ton of studies out on tart cherry for athletes to improve performance and recovery and reduce muscle soreness. Tart cherry has the same value as like taking an aspirin in terms of pain relief, um, but it's also antioxidant and like will reduce oxidative stress, whereas the Mobix and the, and the Celebrexes do not do anything for oxidative stress. They just deplete the amount of cyclooxygenase 2 that's functioning in the arachidonic acid cascade. So the answer is you should be stretching your Achilles, take some tart cherry, and then starting an anti-inflammatory diet like the Mediterranean diet, and that'll supplement your other meds and, and the healing soul. Okay. Okay, we had a question, is there a good source for turmeric? And of course the answer is yes. We're actually coming out with one uh, that I love because it's high dose turmeric with 95% curcuminoids, okay? So it's, it's a valid turmeric source. Plus ginger, which they've done studies of people with arthritic knee joints looking at ginger versus the COX-2 inhibitors or ginger versus ibuprofen. Ginger works just as well and is much more natural and then palmitoyl ethanolamide, which I already told you how beneficial that is to your body, your brain, and your joint health. So this one is gonna have turmeric, PEA, and ginger together. So this is like the ultimate joint health multi, in my opinion. There's a ton of sources of turmeric out there. Just make sure it's probably 90 to 95% curcumoids, and it's, it's not a bunch of the root. Um, turmeric is where you get like curry-based foods and whatnot. It's got that sort of orange color. Um, a lot of it's not really digestible, but, um, you want to have it with at least a certain percentage of piperine from the black pepper to help it be a little bit more digestible and hopefully in an oil, which also helps it be digestible. Uh, you want to be on at least a thousand a day. Milligrams. Not a thousand pills. Uh -huh. So Vicki just told me that she found a quote unquote skinny roux, which those of you watching not from Louisiana, roux is R-O-U-X. That is the base of most Louisiana cooking, which traditionally is butter and flour that you heat up and you make this sort of goo and that's, then you add everything to it. Hers has all avocado oil and almond. Is that what you said? Some kind of nut oil and avocado. Um, that's awesome. When I make my own gumbo, I use extra virgin olive oil. I don't even like think about butter putting it in it. Um, and remember I told you I substituted avocado oil for butter in my shrimp scampi and I've actually even baked bread taking the actual avocado from the plant and it's a one-to-one. -one. So if your recipe calls for butter, you can substitute with avocado and it actually tastes the same. So Marsha wants to know if she would be able to get off of gabapentin if she took my nervous system multi. That is what I want. That is my ultimate goal. Can I predict that yet? No. But gabapentin, the only thing it does is reduces glutamate production, but it is so sedating and give, makes people so sleepy and somnolent. It even has some other weird side effects for some people like nightmares, itching, different things like that, and weight gain. Um, it is my hope that this will be able to replace that for a lot of people. I use gabapentin all the time. I have so many patients with nerve-based pain, but I would like to be able to have something else to offer them that doesn't have those bad side effects. Paul Vigay wants to know, how much wine did the Mediterraneans drink in the 50s? I think one to two glasses a day of good red wine. And remember, this is high quality wine, probably made locally in the region. So it's not factory processed wine where they're adding extracts and like different chemicals to get the right flavor profile. Uh, that's the other thing about wine, which probably I should have a lecture on that later. You just gotta be careful about all of your ingredients. So if you wanna have a venison meal, 
cooked with garlic and onion, which is a very good bunch of polyphenols, including quercetin, and a good glass of red wine, you can do that once a month. Fred, Freddie just told us that he's had trouble with his tart cherry order, and I apologize, Freddie. We were out of stock because it's been so great, and people have just loved it, and it's working so well for people. We just got back in stock, and everything's shipping out. Okay, now, now we're getting into non-Mediterranean diet questions. Somebody wanted to know about the Everett shoe, which is my, the version of the flip-flop with straps, so it's a little bit easier for people that can't wear flip-flops. It's going to be coming back online soon. We've been out of stock for a while. Um, I don't understand that. There's a question about turmeric and increasing levels in the blood of certain medications. I assume this is a question about uh, if you take too many natural medicines, is that going to affect your prescription medicine level? That goes down to the cytochrome P450 system in your liver, which are the enzymes that process all chemicals. So the liver is your detox center. So all medicines go through it and get broken down into breakdown products. And if you're taking one thing that depletes the same cytochrome, cytochrome enzyme that your other medicine needs, yes, you can affect the levels. You just check with your doctor or there's certain, there's some websites, I can't remember them off the top of my head, where you can actually look up everything from grapefruit to whatever supplement you want to take and see which cytochrome P450 enzyme it affects. Then you have to compare it to the one that your drug is on. And then you got to know, does it upregulate it or downregulate it? So you may just want to ask your doctor. What kind of cereal can you eat uh, on the Mediterranean diet? So cereal, when I said cereal, that's a generic term for whole grains. So quinoa, barley, bulgur, spelt, all the ancient grains, right? So if you go down that one aisle in the grocery store with all the fancy bags, that's the aisle you want to be in. You don't want highly enriched processed white flour as your cereal or your grain. Oatmeal, steel cut oats, unprocessed oats, really good for you. Um, that's what I'm talking about with cereals. Uh, question is, is it okay to take my supplements with Eliquis? So that is a, Eliquis is a blood thinner. And they've actually looked at the biggest blood thinner of all the supplements is going to be probably, besides garlic, going to be your omega-3s. But I believe that you can take up to 4,000 milligrams. Like you would have to take more than 4,000 milligrams a day to affect how thin your blood is or how much you clot. So yeah, you probably can take Eliquis with, uh, with these supplements. But again... You have to always check with your personal doctor because they, they might know something about your health that we don't know, obviously, just answering a question on a, on a talk. Yeah, somebody just uh, agreed that gabapentin makes them sleepy. Remember, all of the medicines we have to reduce nerve pain are effectively reducing nerve function. So by definition, they're going to make everything work slower make you tired, make you gain weight, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right, last question. The question is, are canned vegetables bad? Not in and of themselves. Remember, that was the way that you preserved vegetables before. I remember my parents canning vegetables from our gardens um, so that nothing would go to waste. If you do it the old school way where it's just blanching, throwing it in a can, vacuum sealing it, that is awesome. It preserves the phytochemicals and you can use that down the road. If you're getting canned vegetables that are filled with sodium and other preservatives, maybe that's not so great. Um, but in and of themselves, canning vegetables and even frozen vegetables, if they're frozen in the right way and it's just the vegetable and it's not the vegetable plus eight other chemicals, uh, that's probably good. Again, eating a vegetable is better than not eating a vegetable, um, unless, of course, it's soaked in a bunch of chemicals. So canned vegetables are probably okay. 
And I guess that's it. All right. Wrapping it up. Thank you for listening. Um, if you want to hear about any of the more of that topic, just let us know and maybe we'll go into it deeper down the road. But um, that was it in a nutshell and hopefully kind of gave you some ideas about ways to better your own health without stressing out about it. And have a great day.